Today, we're gonna to put the new M1 Max to the test with some tough video rendering challenges. We're gonna be using four different codecs and two different software packages. Each codec has got different requirements, so we'll see the CPU, the GPU, and the RAM all play a part. Not to mention these specialist video encoding and decoding chips in these computers. To spice things up a bit, we've got some of Apple's best Intel machines to throw into the mix too. This should be interesting. So Dave, why a video editing test? Every YouTube tech channel out there seems to be doing this and we've been saying how these machines might not be suitable for editing professional video. That is true, but if you remember back to WWDC when Apple announced these machines, they demonstrated the M1 Mac uh, running 4K video. In fact, if I recall correctly, there were three 4K streams running and they were applying effects in real time. And it was a really impressive demonstration. You and I got quite excited about it. Yeah, I remember that and uh, we certainly did. It's a good test to really show the performance potential of the M1. Video is one of the things that can really tax a computer, particularly modern HEVC and professional codecs with 10-bit color. So we're going to test those. Now, I know you guys wanna get straight to the results of the test, but I do suggest that you don't skip this bit. We do need to explain what we're testing, how we're testing, and get a couple of caveats out there as well. So before you skip ahead and jump into the comments section, Let's first of all state that any test like this is not necessarily representative of real world performance. Every video is different and your workload is probably different to the next person. As you'll see from the results, there are huge differences between codecs and software and some big surprises. Yeah, and it's also true that when you work with a system for an extended period, you're gonna find other limitations that simply won't show up in a test like this. So we spent a lot of hours completing these tests and compiling the information. Be careful though, that you don't take the results that we present out of context. A single test doesn't represent the full picture of performance on these computers. And as you will see, the computers perform very differently depending on the codec and the software being used. So here are the machines. Representing the M1 lineup, we have the entry level MacBook Air, eight gigabytes with seven GPU cores. Do you think it's really fair to include this one, Dave? Uh, possibly not. Uh, I don't think anyone would seriously consider a machine like this uh, with eight gigabytes of RAM for serious 4K video editing. And I probably wouldn't have included it in the tests, but for all of the hype that's going on on YouTube suggesting that it can do it. So let's find out. Okay, fair enough. And we have the M1 Mac Mini with 16 gigabytes of RAM which is most likely the machine that Apple used at WWDC to demonstrate the footage that yeah, we saw. Probably is. And we need to represent the Intel Mac lineup as well. So we've got a 27 inch iMac with the eight core i9 and Vega 48 GPU. We've got Tom's 15 inch MacBook Pro, again with an eight core i9 and this time the 560X GPU. We've got Pete's 16 inch MacBook Pro with the six core i7 and 5300M GPU. And I believe there's a wildcard machine that we've thrown into the mix. There is. So as regular viewers of the channel will know, I've been playing with a 12-core 2013 Mac Pro with eGPU this year. So we're going to include some results from that too. But can an old Mac Pro from 2013 really keep up with these uh, modern machines and codecs? Some might say you're delusional. Some have said I'm delusional, Pete. And I guess we're going to find out. <laughs> Okay, so I know that you're probably itching to see the results, but we just need to tell you what we're actually testing and why. Right, so for each of our codecs, we've got some sample footage and we've used the footage to create a two minute timeline. And we're splitting the timeline into four 30 second segments. So the first segment is just the video with no adjustments. In the second segment, we've applied a small contrast adjustment to maximize the dynamic range, and we've given it a little bit of color saturation. In the next segment, we take a second stream of the same video and we overlay it with the opacity set to 50%, so the system has to blend the two streams. And finally, we add a Gaussian blur to the second stream. So it gets progressively more difficult for the computer to play back the timeline and render the video. 
Now, timeline performance is rather subjective, so we've kept it simple with the traffic light system. Green means the timeline performance is good with minimal issues. Amber means it's usable, but there are some drop frames in the more complex regions. And red signifies that it's not really usable. And this is an important point. We've switched off background rendering and proxies. Now, it's true to say that with some of these codecs, you would definitely be using those features, and your timeline performance would, of course, improve as a result. Uh, what we wanted to do was to see the raw power of these systems. Uh, and that will mainly be shown with the final render. In all cases, we rendered out a 1080p YouTube-friendly final clip in H.264. We kept the original frame rate of the clip. Some of the footage was DCI 4K, in which case the final render would letterbox slightly. And the codecs that we've chosen are not basic 8-bit consumer type codecs that you get off your camcorder. Uh, all these machines behind us can comfortably handle those. And we're also not looking at any resolution below 4K. Again, any of these machines will breeze through 1080p editing. So we're going to test ProRes 422, H.265 10-bit, Blackmagic RAW in both 4 and 6K, and just for fun, some Red RAW 8K. Not because we would recommend any of these machines for that type of heavy lifting, but again, there are videos out there on YouTube suggesting it's possible. And finally, the software that we'll be using. Uh, all of the machines have the latest version of the Big Sur OS on them. And we're going to be testing Final Cut Pro version 10.5 against DaVinci Resolve 17, uh, the Beta 4. Is it really fair to use a beta? Uh, it's a very mature beta and version 17.1 is about to launch, so I haven't got any concerns other than due to license limitations, we're using the free version of Resolve. Final Cut Pro isn't free, so this perhaps isn't a completely fair comparison, particularly as the full version of Resolve Studio does typically improve final render speeds a little bit, especially when an eGPU is in play. Uh, so we've used the Studio version on the Mac Pro in order to properly test that. But for most people, the free version of Resolve offers plenty of performance, as you'll see. So let's get started. And we're going to start with ProRes, Apple's own codec with Final Cut Pro. What are your expectations, Pete? Well, we've got powerful machines, all Apple, Apple's codec, Apple's software. All of them should run really, really well. They should. So let's have a look and see how they did with our first chart. And in last place, with 2 minutes 56, it's the 2013 Mac Pro with the eGPU. And coming in sixth, with 2 minutes flat, it's the same Mac Pro without the eGPU. Hmm, now that's interesting. We'll come back to that. In fifth place, the M1 MacBook Air with 1 minute 57. And in fourth, it's the 16-inch MacBook Pro with 1 minute 12. And that's beaten by the 15-inch model with 107. And in second place, we've got the M1 Mac Mini with 59 seconds. And the winner this time is the iMac with 50 seconds. Now, the color of the bars that you see on this chart indicates the timeline performance. And just remember, we aren't using any proxies or optimized renders here. So some surprises here for me. The, the Mac Pro is coming in last with the eGPU. Yeah, this is a massive frustration for eGPU users. Uh, when Apple updated Final Cut Pro with the launch of the 2019 Mac Pro, uh, it seemed to spoil the eGPU support for a lot of users, and they haven't fixed this. The Mac Pro has got two GPUs internally, and it doesn't matter what you do with the settings. Uh, Final Cut seems to only ever use one of those internal cards if the eGPU is plugged in, and it barely uses the eGPU at all. Uh, if you don't plug in the eGPU, it uses both of those cards, so you get better performance. Yeah, I remember you having those troubles uh, previously. In fact, isn't that what prompted you to switch to DaVinci Resolve in the first place? Yeah, it is. Yeah, but we'll have a look at those results in a moment. I have to say I'm disappointed that my MacBook Pro lost out to the older model. Yeah, but we will see these two trading blows throughout the test. And something we need to understand is it's all down to what the codec needs. Some need CPU, some GPU. Uh, some are using the encoding chip in the M1 silicon or the T2 chip in the Intel Max. Uh, some favor more RAM. And the 15-inch has a more powerful CPU and it's got double the RAM, don't forget. Mm. And isn't there also a difference in the architecture between the GPUs on these machines? Yeah, we've got quite a few different architectures represented by our machines here. And 
all of these different architectures perform differently depending on the codec that's in use. In fact, it is true to say that some older GPUs will outperform newer GPUs for certain codecs. And the M1 Max, any surprises there? Um, not for the 16 gigabyte model. I mean, Apple told us, I mean, they hyped it up. You know, we expected it to be good. So uh, it's not really surprising, but the eight gigabyte model is some way behind. And I guess that isn't surprising because we're talking about 4K footage with 10 bit color. So let's see how these machines performed with the same timeline in Resolve. In last place, we have that MacBook Air with three minutes 32, and the M1 Mac Mini is sixth with two minutes 35. In fifth, it's the 15-inch MacBook Pro with 226, and fourth, that old Mac Pro manages 158. I'm pleased to see my 16-inch in third place with 1 minute 22, and the Mac Pro with eGPU comes second with 50 seconds. So again, our winner is the iMac, which finished in just 41 seconds. And this time we did see some degraded timeline performance from both the MacBook Air and the Mac Pro. Again, with proxies and optimized footage, it wouldn't be an issue, and Amber does mean that it's still workable. Resolve clearly renders this footage differently. Based on these results, it's more GPU focused, and hence why the MacBook Pros have swapped places. And Resolve actually uses the eGPU on your Mac Pro. It does. Uh, but again, I need to caveat that with the fact that we're using the full version of Resolve Studio on the Mac Pro, and that does support multiple GPUs. Uh, in this case, it's using all three. We should also say that the eGPU, though it has the most powerful GPU here, is limited by the Thunderbolt 2 connection. Yeah, that's true. So, Pete, to help us put this in context, let's bring up another chart where we can show the final cut results underneath the DaVinci results. We've got quite a few different charts in this video, so please feel free to pause them if you want to study them in more detail. I think the difference in performance between the systems is very surprising. These charts might be really useful to help viewers figure out which software will work best for their machine and video format. Yeah, I think so. I've found that I've learned quite a lot through this process, uh, including finding out that getting the 15-inch MacBook Pro for Tom to use to edit my content probably wasn't the best idea. Do we also have a chart with the final cut results and the resolved ones underneath? We do. I have prepared that chart. Here it is on the screen. And again, feel free to pause if you need to. I think what we can conclude is that the M1 Max are very optimized for Apple's own software. Indeed, for most of these machines, if you're editing ProRes and you don't have a powerful GPU, you're better off with Final Cut Pro. Yeah, that's a, a great insight. So let's move on to our second test. This one's going to be tough. It's 4K footage shot at 50 frames per second in H.265 with 10-bit color. And our thanks to our viewer, Graham Laws, for providing the test footage. So, in last place, it's the old Mac Pro with eGPU, which Final Cut hates so much, scoring 5 minutes 14. And sixth, unsurprisingly, is the same Mac Pro without the eGPU at 3 minutes 57. The MacBook Pro 16-inch comes in at 2 minutes 36, and the 15-inch model pips it again at 2 minutes 20. Our MacBook Air finished third with 1 minute 56, and it's the iMac in second place with 1.44. Which means an impressive win for the M1 Mac Mini at 1 minute 42. Now, H.265 footage like this is something that will bring a lot of modern machines to their knees. So this is more a test of that specialist chip within the M1 silicon, and of course the T2 chips in the Intel Macs. Yeah, so presumably the horrible timeline and rendering performance you've experienced on your Mac Pro uh, is because it doesn't have specialist encoding and decoding hardware. It doesn't, so it has to try and use the CPU and GPU to do the same thing. Uh, this is something we've said in our previous videos about Apple Silicon. You know, CPU and GPU horsepower is great, but optimized chips can be designed to do specific tasks like this much faster. And it's one of the key reasons why you can't just look at benchmarks. You need to do real-world tests. Yeah, so conventional wisdom in buying x86 hardware doesn't necessarily translate to Apple Silicon. And I'm guessing that the MacBook Air is able to perform closer to the Mac Mini because it's primarily using the same chip. Yeah, I think so. Uh, although, based on these results, I'd also say that cooling and RAM is having an effect as well. So let's see how the same test went in Resolve. 
In last place, it's the Mac Pro with eGPU finishing in four minutes, four seconds. And in sixth, the 15 inch MacBook Pro with three minutes, 30. The Mac Pro is fifth with 316, and it's the MacBook Air in fourth with two minutes, 57 seconds. The M1 Mini is a third place with two minutes, 32, and the 16 inch MacBook Pro finished second with 155. So our winner by a comfortable margin is the iMac with one minute and four seconds. So a question here, Dave, hmm. why did the Mac Pro with eGPU come last if Resolve uses all the GPUs? That's a good question. And it comes down to the fact that the Mac Pro, as we said, has no optimized hardware for H.265. So Resolve is clearly focusing on the GPU to perform this task, which of course it can do. But here perhaps we have an example of how different GPU architectures may perform differently to our expectations. Yeah, and we're seeing more of the machines struggle with timeline performance here. Uh, let's bring up the final cut results to compare. Again, we can see that the M1 chip would rather work with Final Cut Pro, but with the exception of the 15-inch MacBook Pro, the others all fared a good deal better with Resolve. Okay, and let's swap this chart around so that you can view it from the other perspective. So, can we draw any conclusions at this point? Yeah, I think we can actually. Um, the M1 is very good at working with ProRes, as you'd expect, and also very good with the modern HEVC codecs. It's really well optimized for Final Cut Pro, and frankly, considering this is the first outing for Apple Silicon, uh, the results are incredible, Pete. So, should we believe all the hype? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> no, it's fair to say that we wouldn't recommend any M1 machine with eight gigabytes of RAM for serious 4K and above 10-bit video editing work. We've said previously that pros shouldn't consider the M1. Would you change your view on that considering the outstanding performance of the 16 gigabyte M1 Mac Mini? Uh, no, because I said that based not just on performance. Uh, the performance of the M1 is undeniable, but a decision for pros is based on more than that. This is a new architecture, it's a new operating system, it's got issues, it's got bugs, and these things need to be resolved before it's suitable for mission critical professional workflows. So given the price of a 16 gigabyte M1 Mac Mini, is it worth a serious video editing studio bringing one of these in to add to their arsenal of machines to handle H.265 footage specifically? Yeah, I think there are studios that probably would consider doing that. And the value for the amount of performance you get makes it a bit of a no-brainer as a complement to the existing machines that they might have. Yeah, so a pretty fantastic performance result from the M1 in this comparison. It is, and I'm just really excited to see where Apple can take this next. But before we get too carried away, Pete, I want to try some black magic raw. Yeah, and you actually use this in your videos, don't you? So. I'm guessing we might uh, know what we're expecting and some of the results that's coming up. What's the uh, first test? Well, we're going to use some uh, B-RAW 4K, and this has been shot at 50 frames per second. Uh, we're going to test this in Resolve only because Final Cut Pro doesn't have native support for Blackmagic RAW. They obviously see it as a competition for ProRes. Anyway, here are the results. So in last place, it's the MacBook Pro 15 inch, which completed the render in four minutes 22. Sixth is the MacBook Air, which managed four minutes 12. And it's the M1 Mini in fifth, finishing in three minutes 58. Whereas the Mac Pro came home in fourth with two minutes 59 seconds. The 16 inch MacBook Pro is third with two minutes four and second goes to the Mac Pro with eGPU, completing in one minute 36. So yet again, our winner is the iMac, which thundered through the render in one minute and three seconds. So pretty fair to say that M1 Macs aren't ideal for B-Raw. No, and the air really choked on timeline performance here. Now naturally you could improve that by turning on proxy playback, but it wasn't a great experience overall. So I'm a little bit surprised at two things here. One is your Mac Pro struggling with an amber timeline. Uh, you use this machine all the time to edit B-Raw. Uh, and the second thing is the MacBook Pro 15 inch coming dead last. Yeah. Uh, what I would say is, of course, that our timeline performance assessment is subjective. On a different day with a different source clip and a different project, things could be different. Uh, I don't typically experience problems. I'm not typically layering clips on top of each other or pushing it quite as hard as we're doing in this test. Uh, the performance on the 15 inch, though, that is disappointing because uh, 
you know, I bought it for my workflow. Uh, we do though use it with the eGPU and once you do that, it absolutely flies. Yeah, and that's one of the great things about eGPU, isn't it? You may lose a little bit of the card's performance, but if you have multiple computers, you can use it with all of them at different times. Absolutely, so I use my eGPU with three different computers, so it's been a good value acquisition as far as I'm concerned. But I am quite worried that Apple seem to be forgetting about eGPU, particularly after they marketed it so aggressively. Yeah, that is probably something to talk about another day. For now, I want to see how these machines fared with 6K V-RAW. Now, our sample footage here is shot at 24 frames per second in the Q0 constant quality codec, and the results are quite telling. Timeline performance is definitely taking a hit here. Indeed it is. And just remember, folks, that we're assessing the entire two-minute timeline, including those last segments, which are very intensive. Proxy media probably essential for this one. Anyway, in last place, it's the Mac Pro with six minutes and one second. Uh, then in fifth, we have the MacBook Air completing in five minutes, 17 seconds. And it's fair to say it struggled a lot with this one. Yeah, it did. But the 16 gigabyte mini really surprised me here. We've got reasonable timeline performance and it finished fifth with four minutes, 37. Just losing out to the 15 inch MacBook Pro, which is in fourth with 4.16. Yeah, so a big step in performance to the 16 inch in third with two minutes 47. A very similar to the Mac Pro with eGPU in second with two minutes 31. And the winner is the iMac again, managing a better than real time render performance of one minute 54. And the only machine here to deliver a smooth timeline experience. Again, the M1 Mini delivers a surprising performance, but I'm not sure I'd want to do any serious B-RAW editing with it. No, me neither. Uh, what do you say, Pete, that we up the ante a little bit more? Oh yeah, let's do it. We're gonna throw some 8K red 12 to one footage at these computers. It's 24 frames per second. Uh, and let's look at Resolve first, which natively supports red 8K. Now, as you can see, this is obviously a pretty brutal test and the timeline performance is horrific. Uh, naturally, you would use proxy or optimized media for footage at this kind of resolution. So the timeline assessment is perhaps a little bit pointless here. The results then. In last place, no surprise really, it's the MacBook Air, which finished the render in 8 minutes, 49 seconds. In sixth, and this did surprise me, it's the 16-inch MacBook Pro with 6 minutes, 47. Fifth place honors go to the Mac Mini with 6 minutes, 14. And the 15-inch MacBook Pro is fourth with 5 minutes, 40. Our iMac can only manage third place this time with 4.15, and it's beaten to second by the Mac Pro, which finished in three minutes, 54. Now throw the eGPU into the mix and the same Mac Pro wins with three minutes, 19, and is the only machine to offer a usable timeline experience. So a few surprises here. Any thoughts as to what's going on, Pete? Yeah, it's interesting. The machines are in the order of the amount of RAM they have. So I'm gonna say that's important. The 15 inch MacBook Pro has 32 gig, of course. So it's no wonder it scores higher. Yeah, and I think GPU is also a factor too, as we can see with these top two positions. But again, I find the M1 Mini's performance here to be quite surprising and it excites me for the future. Just imagine what Apple Silicon will be able to do with more cores, more memory and better GPUs. That's quite a, a salivating and exciting prospect for sure. It is. But again, please don't take these results out of context. We are not saying that the best choice for working with RED 8K is a 2013 Mac Pro. Of course not. If we were to spec up these other machines with more memory, then we would definitely have a different order of results. So I'm curious to see the final chart. We did this test in Final Cut Pro as well using the RED plugin. When you import the footage, Final Cut asks how you want it to be treated, and we chose uncompressed 10-bit 422. I think it's fair to say we don't work with RED, so we've got no idea if that's the best choice or not. Uh, we thought it might give the machines the best workout. And of course, they all had the same thing to deal with, so I feel that it's a valid test. Yeah, but it, it's not really comparable to the Resolve test, so we won't do any combined charts on these. Let's have a look at the results. Um, I don't see the Mac Pro here, buddy. Yeah, I did test it and I started a render, but it was clearly going to be very slow. Uh, frankly, I've had enough of Apple sticking two fingers up at previous generation <laughs> Mac Pro owners, and 
Uh, I also, due to my uh, working commitments this week, just didn't have time to complete these long renders, so apologies for that. No, that's fine. It does suck, really, that Apple are disregarding a machine that they were still selling brand new just over a year ago. Anyway, to the results. Last place is the MacBook Air, which took an eye-wateringly torturous one hour, 36 minutes and 54 seconds to complete the render. The MacBook Pro 15 inch wasn't much better with a one hour, seven minute and 54 second score. In third place, the 16 inch MacBook Pro managed 31 minutes, 39 seconds. And in second, making the most of that optimization with Final Cut, the M1 Mini scores 15 minutes, 40. So our winner again is the iMac, finishing in 6 minutes 45 seconds. And you'll notice, of course, that all of the machines rendered much faster with Resolve. And that could be how we've set the project up in Final Cut Pro, or more likely just how Final Cut deals with this particular codec. But uh, it's interesting that Final Cut provided a better timeline experience. But we did have some issues. The MacBook Air struggled hard with this test. And that's the limitations of eight gigabytes of RAM showing up. Uh, the swap file was being hit hard for the duration of the render, over five gigabytes of swap on average, and peaking at almost seven gigabytes. We've said it a bit now on this channel, but I'm gonna say it again. If you're doing serious work, eight gigabytes of RAM is not enough. The M1 chip may have the performance, but go for the 16 gigabyte if you can. Yeah, absolutely. It was also really hot, that MacBook Air. It was thermal throttling throughout the test. We'd expect this 16 gigabyte M1 MacBook Pro to perform similarly to the Mac Mini in these tests. And a 16 gigabyte Air, well, it'd probably be a bit behind because of that thermal throttling. Again, memory seems to play a part in timeline performance. You can ask how the Mac Pro did. Yeah, I did actually assess the timeline performance and I graded it red for the Mac Pro without eGPU and amber with the eGPU plugged in. Okay. So interesting results throughout. How do you think viewers should interpret this data? I think a key thing to say is that you're looking at render times for a timeline with four stages of intensity and render performance drops as the timeline gets more complex. So for example, the M1 Mac Mini was hitting just six frames per second for that last red 8K segment when it was rendering. So as with everything in life, your mileage may vary. I don't think you can watch a showdown like this on YouTube and make the assumption that the results are going to apply to every scenario. Yeah, particularly with video editing, there are so many variables. Your workload is different to mine, which is different to Dave's. But hopefully you found this helpful, or at the very least, entertaining. So finally, Dave, can we draw any definite conclusions? Uh, yes, I think we can. So the M1, what an incredible debut for Apple Silicon. Hmm. And next year's models, well, they've got the potential to do so much more. Uh, if you can wait, I think you should. Now, I've been lambasted for saying that by a few commenters because they're saying, well, of course, things will be better in the future if you wait for it. Uh, that's not what I mean. If rumors are to be believed, we are less than six months away from the next step up in the M1 chips. And Apple are talking about doubling the performance cores, or at least that's what the rumors are. And uh, if that is the case, that is definitely worth waiting for. Yeah, plus we have the potential to move to the three nanometer process, and Apple are talking about a 32 core machine in 2022. Yeah, I think that, that will be absolutely amazing if they do that. We can also conclude that, as we've been saying all along, Apple Silicon performs significantly better when software is carefully optimized to play to its strengths. Yeah. I'd also like to say that your old Mac Pro did pretty well in some of these heavyweight codec tests. Yeah, it did. There's a bit of life in the old dog here. There definitely is. Um, some people question why I'm using such an old machine instead of the 2019 Mac Pro, but as I've said previously, I, I almost bought a 2019 Mac Pro when Apple announced the transition, so I decided to hold off. This 2013 model actually works fine for the things that I do. Hmm. Tech manufacturers love to sell on performance numbers and FOMO. FOMO, Pete? Yeah, so that's fear of missing out. Uh, we look at the specs on new hardware and because it's better than what we've already got, uh, we get made to feel that our current kit is somehow inadequate. Uh, and in some cases, that's just not true. And those new specs won't necessarily make us work any faster. That is, yeah, that's very true. Uh, and finally, I think I can safely say that if you want an Apple computer, 
that delivers solid and great performance for video editing. And you can't justify a 2019 Mac Pro? Buy an iMac. <laughs> Absolutely. And you can get those with an even faster 5700 XT GPU and the RAM is user upgradable. Wow. Remember when Apple used to do that? So that's it for our big showdown, but we've got more Apple Silicon videos planned. So if you are fed up with hearing about video editing, sit tight, we've probably got something coming for you as well. Yeah, and there'll be more quick update videos as we discover things worth sharing. So that's it for this video, and I hope that all our hard work was enough to earn a thumbs up. Or a thumbs down? No, Pete, I, I think that'd be really mean. <laughs> yeah, I do too. So perhaps if you didn't enjoy it, Share the video with someone who you think might. <laughs> Excellent. And please uh, consider supporting the channel with just one click of that subscribe button. Uh, in any case, I hope to see you next time for some more geekery.